You're listening to the 40 Fit Radio Podcast, dedicated to the 40-plus community. Join us as we discuss the truth about fitness and health using science, reason, and the experiences of our host and content experts. Welcome to the 40 Fit Nation. Hey, welcome back to 40 Fit Radio and welcome back to the 40 Fit Nation. I'm here with my co-host, Coach Trent. That's me. <sighs> Do you hear the crowd? Sorry. Hold on a second. Let me we have quiet some them static down. on the radio. That's, uh, you static guys, on the radio. We're, we're recording live here. So, it's kind of uh, like, you yeah. know, now that we're in the whole COVID-19 thing, it's kind of like you watch pro football now or you yeah. watch some pro sport and you hear all these fans in the background. I'm like, there's no one there. <laughs> it's just How canned. Can they, it's piped in. <laughs> just canned. It's just like when you go into a, a store to shop or something, they pipe in chocolate chip cookies. You see... This oh, yeah. is all a ploy so to get us to watch and buy things. You're looking at latex paint, and you, you get that whiff of, of Nestle's chocolate chip cookie. I think cookie you've been hanging you're... out in the paint aisle at Home Depot too much. Okay. Maybe it's the paint, yeah. not the cookies. Yeah, I know oh, okay. you're a little uh, well, sniff-sniff kind of guy. Scratch you know. and sniff, and I don't want to mention who that is. All right, so, hey, we got a great guest in the house today, live in Keller, Texas, the mecca of 40 Fit Radio. And we have Charity Hambrick, a close friend of both uh, Trent and I, who is eyes a word, eyes, Trent and I. It is in Texas. Of both, uh, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's probably not in Oklahoma, Just though, like, where Charity Hill's from. Yeah. So we've got Charity Hambrick in the house, and she is an unbelievable strength coach, barbell lifter, mom, wife, consultant to the stars. Well, Charity, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Charity. And uh, yes, I'm friends of both of these boys for a long time. And I, uh, I'm all those things. But my newest, my yes. newest title is I'm going to be a homesteader. So homesteader, home right? Setter. Yeah, yeah. Her, her, and her husband have Scott have just um, and Scott basically founded and started uh, online great books that Trent is involved with on some of the podcast stuff and other things. Mm-hmm. Um, and a uh, great, great organization. Check that out. Online, great books.com. Is that what it is? Online, yeah, great books. Online, great books.com. I'm okay. actually, I'm a, I'm a client as well. Oh, I do it. Uh, right. Jordan and I both. I'm not uh, only the owner. I'm a client, you know? That, <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's like the, it's like the hair, the hair products. Hair yeah. products guy. yeah. So yeah, that, that wouldn't go it's over true. too well for me. I'm not the owner. <laughs> I'm a client and people would go, uh, we're not going there. Yeah. Because that guy's got no hair, man. I mean, plain and simple. He's got no hair. So so it, it's okay, Charity. You can laugh on the follically, podcast. Follically She's blessed. laughing hilarious mm-hmm. in the background. But um, but yeah, so Scott's an unbelievable barbell coach and lifter himself, too. We all met through Starting Strength and other venues, uh, Starting Strength Online Coaching and other things. And so, But um, yeah, they're, they're building a compound yep. mm, in yeah. Oklahoma. Compound. Do you have a name for your compound? No, not yet. We Chateau de no. Hambrick. I think you ought to call it du- the Double H Ranch well, and do the A Double H Rafter, and then you'll call it the Hamburg Homestead. Okay, I like that the best. I could probably sell that. Scott wanted to call it something ridiculous, yeah. and I was like, no, I can't even remember what it was. I vetoed it and. <laughs> no vacancy. The NV Ranch. The NV Rafter. Yes, Darren. Ranch. I'm going to have critters. Yeah. No vacancy I'm gonna have critters, ranch. So. I want, well, what kind of critters? I want some cows, but um, sheep. Yeah. the return is so quick and uh, a lot, yes. a lot easier. Yeah, it is. So maybe sheep. Yeah. The only thing about sheep that's less easy, I'm gonna tell you two things. Number one is fencing. Yeah. You got to make sure you've got the proper fencing. You cannot use uh, traditional barbed wire because they will get out and they will hurt themselves because sheep are dumb. Yeah. I'm just saying you. They have a very low. Well, intellect I'm thinking level. poly wire. Now, so I'm gonna get them used to being. Uh, yeah shocked so they'll be scared of the white yeah, that's that's <laughs> we don't call that shocked we call that basically um just um encouraged diversion right. control <laughs> of the animal so but um we want to be peter friendly on this show of uh, course and so the other thing about sheep is they get more diseases than cows so you just got to keep all their vaccines yes. up you got to keep them healthy good clean water all that kind of stuff my cousin, who runs a feedlot up in um, Kansas, um, tried to talk me into some sheep too, because you know the yield on cows is the yields on the yield on beef and cattle is is pretty low, yeah. um, unless you've got a replacement organization operation where you're. 
providing like um, bread heifers, replacement heifers, replace you know bulls, um, bread cows, that type of thing. The, then um, and registered to then it, yeah, the the yield is really low. I think right now, uh, six hundred weight steers about a buck forty um, per pound. So that would be one hundred and forty per one hundred, which is mm-hmm. bad. That means bad. That means very it's bad. Not good. Yeah. We'd like to see it up around one eighty to two ten. For the beef market, but you know it is what it is. I take a bunch of calves to market next month. I'll be up in Oklahoma. Really? Where are you going? How close? I don't remember the rest of the song. You don't remember the rest of the song. You are Texan. So I'll be in El Reno. Yeah, there's nothing in El Reno but to sell at the sell barn. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Sell barn. That's where I'll be. I'll be in El Reno. All right. So we're going to talk. What are we going to talk about today, Trent? Yeah, so uh, Charity, we had you on the show because you and I were talking about offline how we, because some of the strategies we use as a coach to encourage and coach those people who aren't really into training. You know, if you're listening to this show, dear listener, you're probably into training because you're listening to this show. You know, I think people that really aren't into working out and training probably aren't listening to our podcast. And so um, that's what we want to talk about today is. What do you do when you want the benefits of barbells, but you don't really like the process of lifting barbells? Right. The the first thing I think people need to understand is you don't have to start it and like it. You may learn to like it. You may learn to appreciate it, but you may never like it. But we do lots of things in life that we don't like, and we do them every day. One, maybe your job. Right. I'm on 40 fit. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Yeah. I like being here. But, you know, people need to realize that. And it's not a bad thing that you don't like it. Right. You shouldn't feel bad. You shouldn't project your feelings onto your coach or uh, people in the gym that you don't like. It's just you do you. You know you need the benefits. You check the box. You take the pill and you move on. It will get better. It will because uh, if you've read any kind of uh, work on – cognitive recognition and all of that stuff. I, my favorite study is this one where they take rats, of course, and uh, they're doing, they want to see the effects of uh, changing cognitive behavior through resistance training. And so they actually load these little mice with weights. It's so ridiculous. And they run them through stuff. But the one of the groups, they've been, they have a little rogue belts on. A that's little well, that is like how I'm envisioning it, of course, when I'm reading the paper. <laughs> And some of them have been uh, have had fat injections, you know, in their brain to make inflammation and stuff kind of jack them up, of course. But the cool thing is, no matter what they've done to each of the groups, the only group that fails is the ones that are sedentary, that don't do anything. And that's my that is my biggest point on this whole thing. The wrong answer is doing nothing. Well, we had a guy that commented on our on our um, Facebook page. Um, that I know fairly well, and um, Charity had piped in on there and basically said, hey, he was basically saying, when I travel, I have no access to equipment sometimes, no access to a gym. A lot of the gyms are still shut down with COVID and the restrictions. Yeah. And so I, my, my bar, barbell program rocks and rolls while I'm at home in my home gym. But then when I'm away, I really lose touch with it, and then I have to come back to it. And what, what should I be doing when I'm away? And Charity made a great point. Do something. Yeah. Do something, even if it's body weight stuff, even if it's, you know, a walk, a hike, a sp- sprint intervals, uh, most hotels. And that's the other thing that like I, I dumbbells, said on that comment. They always. Most hotels have dumbbells and stuff like that. You can find something to do. Just mimic the movements that you're doing in your normal training program. You're just going to have a lot lower load. So you might increase the volume or increase the intensity yeah. to cause that metabolic effect. Because high intensity interval training with lower loads and higher reps is very effective in building muscle for a while. And so uh, that was our point is do something. You know, I think this conversation is all about this. And I said this earlier offline. Most people are not like us. They're not like the three people sitting in this this make believe virtual reality room (laughs) we're in right now. Right. They are not necessarily into barbells. They're not into the barbell, the physical culture. They're not into the history of barbells or lifting or strong men or strong women or anything like that. They're not into uh, the barbell industry. 
They're not into barbell concepts. We are the exception to the rule. I'm just telling you, most people go out into the public right now. Yeah. Forget about asking your friends, but ask your friends. Uh, us three, I would challenge us to ask our friends, but we know the answer to that. Go and just ask 10 people on the public, 100 people on the public right now and say, what do you think about barbells? Training with barbells. <laughs> and they're like, uh-uh, uh, not, not so much. And so I think that our job as coaches, and Charity, you said it really well, is to get people into the gym and not convince them of anything. It's to really let them convince themselves. It's to see the value in, and Charity, you put it so poignantly, that there are a lot of things that we do in life that just aren't fun, that are hard all the good stuff. I always say, you never tasted the sweet until you've tasted the sour. Yeah. You never know how good life really is and how good some things are until you have had the antithesis of that. You've had the opposite to that. Yeah. Uh, I believe it's Socrates that says this somewhere. Don't don't ask me where. I have to go look it up. But uh, I believe it could be Howard Stern. He, 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 he's, it, it, we could, it actually Howard could be. Howard Stern earlier. I just popped actually, into my brain. It could be. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but Socrates says somewhere uh, uh, something along the lines of uh, some people confuse pleasure with the absence of pain. Yeah, I get it. And I think you know you said that it's not always going to be this way necessarily. If you uh, if you if you start this process, you mean like man, this is really hard. Like this is um, it it kind of hurts. It doesn't hurt, but it's it's this hard effort. It's di- it's uncomfortable doing this barbell training. Uh, Because it is. It is. We get it. You know, we've been there before and we understand. But some people confuse the absence of discomfort with pleasure as in that's a good thing. Like, so taking it easy, right? Kind of like, let's, you know, let's not do anything too hard now. Um, And some people confuse that with pleasure. And that's, in fact, not the case. There's a lot of things that are hard in the moment, but you can derive a lot of pleasure from, right? I'm a musician. I play guitar. I've played for years. It's really hard. It's still, when I learn a new piece of music, sometimes I just sit there and I'm like, I've played for this long and I can't, it's like, I can't even make heads or tails of this thing. But you finally get to a point, you put in the work and you get to a point where you can play something that you couldn't before. And you're like, wow, this is really great. It brings me a lot of pleasure. I'm not there. I can play four (laughs) chords and I hate it. (laughs) Right. I hate it. I hate it. I can't get past the hate part. Yeah. It's the perfect analogy of barbell training for most people. Yeah. And by the way, guys, I don't take bar. The fact that I think barbell training is terrible for most people, most people hate it. I think most people will learn to at least like it, maybe not love it, but at least like it over time. They like the results. They like the benefits. They like the quality of life. They like the output from the input. But yeah, I mean, guitar, I mean, when I'm playing guitar, which I wouldn't call what I do playing guitar, but... I'm, I, the work is so hard for me right now. Yeah. You know, I have an acoustic guitar out at the ranch and I right. like to strike some chords on it. But it's so hard for me that I just so unlike that because I'm so good. I'm, I'm kind of a jack of all trades. I can do a little bit of everything <laughs> relatively well. And it bugs me when I pick up the guitar and I really suck at it. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, this is not fun. So you're telling me I just need to go through the work do the hard stuff, and then eventually one day I'll pick up that guitar and I'll like it. Yeah, well, and very similar to training, the way we approach training is pick something that's within within reach, right? You know, if you're like, I want to play like Segovia. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, okay. Well, I picked up a Joe Chatriani. Um, <laughs> yeah, album I was like, I want to play, uh, play that one Surfing song. with the Alien. <laughs> yeah, on Surfing with guitar, the Alien. Like, yeah. Right? Uh, okay, well, maybe not. But you can you could learn uh, you could learn right, right, a eruption. couple songs to strum. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah let's look, I'm gonna yeah. learn a r- eruption on the acoustic guitar. Yeah, that's yeah, that's, that's a, what happens to that, my fingers when I play. That's, that's like the walking in the gym. <laughs> it's like walking in the gym and saying like, ah, I think I want to try 600. Yeah, you know, this is the yeah. first day you've ever lifted. It's just ridiculous, right? It's it's or so like, far to reach. Like, yeah. I, th- I think I'll press like Chase Lindley today. Yeah, I think I'll try that. Let's try four hundred pound press. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think that's 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 a big part or like, of this. Or like Charity Hamburg. Yeah. Right. It's we didn't like, really talk about how strong Charity Hamburg uh, is. Charity, what what are your PR lifts for the squat, press, bench press, and deadlift? Three fifty squat, Boom. press, not in the meet, but in my home, one sixty two and a half or double. It's pretty good for me. Um, yeah, that's good. Bench press, my bench right now, which I've never really focused on. It's been I'm crushing, crushing it. it right now. I just hit uh, like four for 205. Holy crap. So 
I've got I mean, male clients that were doing three sets of five at one sixty. So I, I really don't right. know. The last time I even tested my one rep on bench, it was two and a quarter. And I think if I would have tried two thirty first, it would have went fine because it wasn't grindy. Yeah. Boom. Oh, yeah. You could certainly do that now. Fit two four reps at two hundred five. Yeah. yeah. Deadlift. Uh, yeah. Deadlift. My deadlift's always stinky. Three. I've done three eighty five in the in my gym. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah, that's it. What's, what's she's really strong, too? and she's not young I'm either. Old. She's old like like us. Yes. You're forty. Wait, no, no, no. I'm wait. I won't be forty six until February. I'm forty five. Oh, oh, okay. Oh. There we go. Scott yeah. just forty five. I'm sorry. So yeah, I get confused. Yeah, you know, it's going good, but are you. <laughs> well, you're in the forty. I have to slow down. Yeah, Seriously, people. Decade. I haven't really felt a birthday. What I call a birthday change, probably until like six months yeah. after my forty fifth birthday, and then I thought. Something's different. Mm, and it yeah. was weird. I was like, is maybe I yeah. just have a cold. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, it's not going away. It's age. <laughs> you know what was really <laughs> weird for me? When I when I really started picking barbells up again was when we started our when I started to CrossFit again. And you know, I would use barbells and workouts and wads and conditioning workouts and stuff. And then I would back squat and deadlift and press and I wouldn't bench press at all hardly. But I would do the main lifts, a lot of compound lifts and a lot of Olympic lifting like power snatch, power clean, squat clean, jerk, things like that. But, but I was, let's see, when I opened my first CrossFit gym, I just turned a little over 40. So all of a sudden I found this fitness world, this new fitness world. And I had been involved in, you know, health and fitness all my life, but I found this new fitness world. I was like, this is awesome. And I started hitting all these PRs in my forties, you know, so I was Mm -hmm. crushing it in my early forties. And then in my late forties, I had four back surgeries and two shoulder surgeries. And see, that's what happens, kids, when you start playing with yep. firecrackers. Now, that's not to say that you shouldn't lift and you shouldn't do, you know, training, physical training. It's just to say sustainable fitness people, sustainable, something that you can do. I'm an all or nothing kind of guy. You know, I, I just, know. I that's me too. It's like, if I can't win the prize, right. then crush and that's, it. that's what people don't understand. Like, if you hired me as a coach, I don't expect you to be me. Don't try that. That's something I have right, chosen yeah. to do. And sometimes it's not smart. I've had one shoulder surgery. And when I went in for that one, they were like, the other yep. one's coming. I'm like, okay. But uh, yeah. that's my choice. But that's not, I don't want to say norm. Uh, I hate the normy thing. But right. for everyday majority of the crowd, whatever you want to call the people out there that aren't the crazy ones like we are, uh, that's not normal. You don't ever have to put a singlet on. A lot of people, I think, are frightened that right. if they yeah. start this, they're going to be forced to do a meet. No. He's like, right. I got to put that on? <laughs> I wear the singlet around the pool, though. I'm going on vacation in a week. You I'm are. I'm going to wear my singlet. Yeah. Nice. I'm going to Mexico. I want to go to Mexico. Yeah. Yep. I'm getting out of town for a little bit of time. You know, we were supposed to go to Europe and South Africa. I was supposed yep. to do an African hunt and go to South Africa and Cape Town, and then go back up into Europe, into England, and then and then go back up into Scotland and lift some stones in Scotland and come back to England and then fly back yep. over and they squashed COVID your dream. Hit, got that canceled. Then we're supposed to go to Hawaii at the end of this month. COVID hit and that got canceled. So instead we're going to Mexico. That's better so than that's nothing. better than nothing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've always oh, yeah. had a good time Absolutely. in Mexico. Yeah, You'll absolutely. love it. So um, we talked about, okay, so first of all, like just kind of doing a mindset shift when you start training of, um, you know, you may not like this now, but give yourself a chance. Give yourself a chance. And remember that just because it's uncomfortable doesn't mean it's bad and that there are good things that can come from discomfort in the short term. And so now you're talking about also shifting your mindset of from away from this all or nothing thinking where uh, you don't have to be a power lifter just because you're lifting barbells, right? In fact, you can, you can lift just to get strong enough for life. So Charity, how many clients do you have that, how far do they go with their barbell training? Let's talk about your, your clients whose goal is just to be generally fit and healthy, but they have no aspirations to be an athlete or a power lifter or anything like that. How far do they generally go with barbell training? Well, I've had, I have probably a top 10 list of people that I've had for five years now that I thought would have, when the beginning, I was like, they're not staying. And they're still with me. Yeah. And, um, you know, awesome. that, that's not all me. That's them. They've stuck with me. Uh, but it's been a process of me, I think, kind of helping them refine uh, how they think about things. Because ultimately, that, that's what's yeah, led them to yeah. be here five years later. It's not just picking up the weight. 
So, um, right. you know, there's days they're like, I can't, yeah. you know, and it, I'm, I'm having this and I'm having that. And it's up to the coach. I think you have to respond to that being sympathetic. Yes. Having some empathy, but mm-hmm, at the right. same time, you have to have a firm hand of like in your, at least in my mind, this is what I'm going to do. So there's ways of what I call a uh, trickery or my wizardry, you know, you, craftiness. Yeah. My craftiness yeah, yeah. that I can get what I need from them. And maybe at a slower rate, you know, they're going to be make PR slower, but I'm upfront with that. I'm honest. I'm like, look, it's going to, if that's not a big priority for you, they'll be there, but it's going to be drawn out longer. And we're just going to keep getting under the bar. And I think in the beginning it starts that way. And some of them that's, they just want to keep it like that. But yeah, then, yeah. you know, I have a few that have the taste for it. And then they're yeah. like, what else? What else? And yeah, then yeah. then you can start being a little normal. But at the same time as a coach, it's important that you understand it's okay if those people want to stay that way. Yeah, there's, absolutely. There's yeah. only so much you can change. That's that, There's a lot of wisdom in that. And Trent and I have said a thousand times here at 40 Fit and at our gym that – that's that's one of the perspectives that we really hold dear to, and that's the fact that not everybody is going to go do a meet. Not everybody has to squat. I know this is, I know this is. What's that word you use when you're saying something about religion that's not acceptable? Sacrilegious. So yeah. Not only sacrilegious, but also what's the other word? Her- that, that, that you know where it's it's heresy. It's heresy. You know, yes. it's her- this is heresy in the barbell strength coaching world, especially as starting strength coaches. Yeah. And that is this. Not everybody has to squat to depth. Not everybody has to do no. every exact thing according <laughs> to the model. Yeah. We use the model as a template on the front end. And then there are some clients that we have to modify the model and modify the movement approach because we're still getting them under resistance loads. We're yeah. still training them. We're still getting, this is not exercise. It's still training. And I think that we get so serious about coaching people that if they don't top out the LP, we're crushed as coaches that, that, you know, they weren't able to get all the gains, you know, yeah. with a Z. And so I think that it's really important that our perspective is a little broader than that and more sustainable than that to say, if you've got a 65 year old client that you're training and he or she is under the bar two to three times a week and doing other accessory exercises and living a healthy life and eating good foods. It doesn't matter if they're peaking. Yeah, that's right. It doesn't matter if they've reached their maximum genetic potential, if that's not their goal, you know, and that's hard to, that's hard to digest as a coach. No, that wants excellence from the people. No, it's not. That's, that is where I would like to work on that. Coaches need to not be crushed the, that is part of coaching. If you're a good yes. coach, you know when it's time to shut up and not only listen to the client, but listen to that inner dialogue in yourself. It has, it's not your adventure. Yeah. Well, you're, Ooh, the, right. you're the facilitator, but Ooh. it's not your adventure. You need yeah. a t-shirt, t-shirt. Uh, you need a t-shirt that says, well, Charity says, Coach Charity says, it's not your adventure, dot, 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 dot. It, yeah. it, this is the, and I'll be honest, if anybody hears this out there that no, I've coached you in the very beginning, I apologize because I was that coach where I was just driving you, yeah. driving. Yeah. No, I th- really? And I think they, we've all done And that. they would get yeah. through the end of LP and they're like, they're out, they're, they're done. You know, I, I scared them. That yeah. is my fault. So if you're yeah. listening, I apologize and please come back because I <laughs> yeah. am much more refined. Now. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh, a hundred percent. I'm, I'm a hundred percent guilty of that too. Um, we all are. And yeah, I think you get sold out. I, I think here, here's, here's, I think this is interesting, uh, insight. I've learned this from, um, Dr. Pewter, who's been on the podcast and he's a, he's a friend of ours. Uh, Dr. Pewter has been running a series on personality traits on his podcast, psychiatry and psychotherapy. And one of the, one of the big five personality traits that they use in the clinical setting to learn how to connect with, with patients when they're doing therapy is conscientiousness, right? And I'm not going to try to define it because I'm probably going to screw up the, the definition from a clinical standpoint, but more or less, I think most coaches and very serious athletes are very high conscientiousness people. In other words, we value goals and we value the the seriousness of our craft and the process of of doing anything very highly. And so when we when we go and do something, we want to do it to a very high level. We want to always we're always looking to do our best at a thing. 
And not everyone is wired like that. And that's in fact okay, right? There, there is, there's a reason why the human population has varied personality traits. We need all types of people in our society. But you have to recognize as a coach that not everyone is, has the same goals and has the same outlook on life that you do. Not everyone is trying to maximize the things that they've chosen to do. And uh, one thing we have to be careful of as coaches, just like therapists have to be careful of in their clinical practice, is not to impose our values on the people that we're coaching. Uh, the, the, the fancy clinical word for that is uh, counter-transference. But it simply means that if we're not careful and we're not listening to the goals of our clients, then we can end up imposing our goals on them and they feel that. People pick up on that. And then now we put them in a position of them disappointing. They feel like they're disappointing us because yeah. we've imposed our goals on them rather than celebrating the goals that they have set for themselves. You will get stronger. <laughs> right. I don't care if you like it. You will get stronger. Yeah. <laughs> Shut up. This is my gym. This is my program. Give me those shoes and belt. <laughs> right. I'm the lifter. <laughs> Your squat sucks. <laughs> yes. I mean, I mean, we, we kind of yeah. get get that way and some of that's a testosterone and the and you and you. yeah i think that one thing i learned i have a client right now she's in her mid to late 60s and she this this woman has the perfect anthropometry and really nice she carries a lot of muscle mass for her size mm -hmm. in her age and she could squat probably i'm not joking this 67 year old woman could probably squat in the mid twos, nice, you know, easily nice. if she wanted to, and she just doesn't want to. I know, and I'm that's like, when it's hard. how can you not want that? Uh, right? How yep. can you? Do? She's pressing like in the eighties, like uh, uh, you know. No, she pressed up in the seventies and eighties. I think she's bench pressing. She could press in the one twenties. One, th I mean, bench press in the one twenties, one thirties. Yeah. She deadlift in like one eighty five for triples. You know, two sets of three. It's just, and I'm like. You could be really, really strong, but here's the reality, folks. In our world, she's not that competitively strong. But in the real world, she's crazy strong compared yeah. to her, co her cohorts. Yeah. Yes. She's yeah. really strong. I have to keep that perspective. I have to keep that sustainable perspective. So she came to me recently and she said, I don't want to go up anymore on my squat and my lifts. I don't want to go up anymore. I'm like, you have to. You have to get stronger. You know, you're going to get stronger no matter what. No, but no, the reality yeah. is I came to her and said, okay, great. Then let's throw some accessory work. So we started doing some arm work to sculpt our arms, work our arms, some lap pull downs, some chins, some other things that are lighter weights that are more, you know, um, isolated. And, but we still squat and we still deadlift and we still press and we bench press. We're just not climbing anymore. Right, right. We're just not climbing. And if we lose a client... Because in charity, you said it perfectly earlier. If we lose a client because we didn't adapt our program to their program. And at the end of the day, we didn't keep them stronger. Like we had gotten them. That's no one's fault. But our, right. but our own. We missed the mark. We've missed the mark. So I want to dig into this a little bit uh, more. So uh, these clients that you've had long-term for five years, Let's talk about the history of their training. If we look at just kind of on a, a, a big macro level, what has their training looked like? You know, did they do a linear progression? Did they go any further than that with, with barbell training? What does their program look like today, five years later? Because I think some people are, are curious. I think some people, when they get into this and they're like, man, this is really hard. They're like, am I going to do this forever? Like just for the rest of my life? I'm like, oh my God. So what does it look like now? They all went through LP, you know. Okay. Um, it may How not long be does that last? It depends. Uh, six to eight weeks or eight to 12. Okay. Just so depends. A few depends months, on the, maybe. Right. Depends on the person. And then after that, you know, I hate to say when I was first coaching, it was like program to program to program, you know, five, three, one. Well, nope, don't do that crap anymore. Um, yeah. It is more tailored to the person. And, you know, a lot of that is um, MED, you know, minimum effective dose programming. It works, yeah. you know. So most of my people, my favorite is honestly four day split, upper lower. If they can't do it over the four days, then we stretch it out. You know, it's still a Monday, Wednesday, Friday program. We just it's just Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Monday. Okay. And yep. they like that. And here's why. It's short. 
Yeah. You can mm-hmm. get in, yeah, in you can out. get out. That is important. Coaching needs to, is another thing. You are playing with people's time, time that they can't get back. Now it's time that you're using that they're going to get a reward, right? But that reward is not seen for, it could be weeks, months. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you need to be careful with it. You know, you need to make them feel like that she's respecting my time. She's giving me this stuff, but she knows I have other stuff to do. And that's just one factor they can put in their brain to let them know that we're on their team. We understand what they want to do and in a timely manner too. So they feel like they have time to come in and do the work. These are all layers that you're laying in. It's like an onion that we're building, mm, not peeling yeah, away. Yeah. We're building the layers because yeah. you want to cut, you want to make a harmonious connection between the aspects of training and daily life where they merge, where it becomes a relationship. And then eventually that the client, the lifter is um, managing it like a marital relationship and knows mm-hmm. that there's going to be ups and downs, but you're not yeah. going to give up on it, but you have right. to build that every time you're with those clients. It starts day one. Day one, you introduce them to the weights, the marriage begins there. And then I'm kind of like the counselor, you know, I'm working it. I'm like, yes, it's your friend. You know, we're making it fun. I'm valuing your time. And, you know, and then we begin the work and the work's not always with the weight. That's what I'm real big on this. Yeah, I'm a good strength coach, but honestly, I like the psychology of it. I like seeing people's minds change. Because you can get a nervous kid come in there, and by the time you're done with him, he's a strong man. And not just yeah. his physique. Right. His, his, exactly. his mind is changed yeah. if right. you do it Absolutely. right. Minds, emotion, psyche, yes. yeah. the whole thing. Well, yeah. I'm just I'm just listening to you talk and I even I haven't even had any whiskey. It's it's nine o'clock in the morning, not even nine o'clock in the morning. And I just get kind of I I got a little not emotional, but yeah, a little emotional about hearing you talk and hearing you talk about your perspective because i met you about probably about three years four years ago three or four years ago you're a different person (laughs) i'm older you're a different person yeah you're older 45th birthday (laughs) you're you're older but but you're a different person i hear you talk and the way you coach and hear your confidence and hear your level of maturity and your coping skills and your life skills now. And I know that you and Scott have your own counselors and, and you, yeah. you, you're you involved in that. And I know that you're involved in, in your weightlifting and your family and everything else. And, and you're a different person. And I think that part of that comes from, all of that comes from doing the hard. Yeah. And I think what you said earlier about making that connection for people that this will improve your quality of life. Trust me, just go through the process. The process is true. The process works. There's beauty in the work. There's beauty in the journey. You know, like I always say, it's not the destination, it's the journey, but everybody wants, I mean, you arrive at your destination. Every time you go into the gym, you're at a new destination. And so it it is about the journey, but there is a new becoming every single workout incident every single input and so i think just listening to you talk and everything is what this is all about i mean it's it's how you've adapted your training we've had several conversations about your own health and learning how to give and take because at the end of the day i mean i'm the oldest guy in the room guys i am the elephant in the room but um i i'll just say it to you this way um you ain't getting no younger (laughs) right you don't feel no younger yeah. When you hit yeah. your fifties, you know, you, you definitely feel the, the foul. Thou- I, I feel the thousands of squats and deadlifts and burpees and CrossFit workouts and gymnastics, college workouts and gymnastics, high school, grade school workouts. And uh, my orthopedic surgeon friend and I, as we just talk, we just talked the other day and we were just talking about the fact that, you know, maybe we should just kind of lightly use our body until we get to 40. <laughs> and then we start crushing it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, because that's, right? that's when it gets really it good depends, where right? we can actually, you know, enjoy being out on the beach and, and we have some yeah, money, right. you know, and we can do some of these some, things. Have but some free time. Have and, some resources, yeah, you know. Yeah. And so, But we kind of get it opposite. We, we, we crush ourselves when we're young and then we're just kind of broken, beaten and scarred to coin a Metallica song when we get old, you know. Right. Yeah. So, well, and I think, I think this is a trait of, of high, high achieving people is that we all we all usually miss on the side of uh, we err on the side of too much. <laughs> and then we learn afterwards, like, dang, I shouldn't have gone that hard. 
next time. And then we always push a little too far. Yeah. And that's, you know, that, that's a, that's, it's part of our personalities. You know, it's just the way, way we're wired. But I think that, yeah, I think charity, I, th- I think you made an awesome point. And I, I love that everything that you want in life is going to require some hard work and effort. And if you can learn how to put in the hard work with something simple like training, it will bleed over into other aspects of your life. But on the other hand, to do this long term, you have to incorporate it in your life, just like you would anything else, right? Like yep. like working on a marriage, right? It's just a continuous project, your your entire relationship. And you, you don't get to just like, okay, we have a good relationship now. Let's just put it on the shelf. It doesn't work that way. Yet It's a continuous process of, of nurturing that relationship that you have. And in order to make that work, it has to be harmonious with your life. And that's, yeah, I, I like that. I think it takes a mature athlete to be to understand when it's okay to to lay out for a while and to take it easy and just do something and then know when to turn it back on and push a little bit and and gain and grow but it's it takes work and effort to get there right you have to go through the process of something hard first before you can get to this point where you can start to let this training meld with your life and and ebb and flow yeah and people need to understand there are some days I don't want to train. Don't yeah. think that I'm like on all ditto. the time yeah. out ditto, there. Ditto. <laughs> like just, yep. yay for me. Let's get out. No, people, yeah. I'm human. There are days yeah. I don't want to. And right. on those days, um, there's I have, I have a protocol for those days. And everybody should have some sort of protocol. And here's mine. I'm having a crappy day. Number one, I put on my favorite shorts. Number one. I don't even care if they're dirty. You go get them out of the hamper. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> We're wearing those shorts. <laughs> the hamper camper. That's right. You get, get them on and yep. then you read the last thing you wrote to yourself in your training log. Because I guarantee you, it's going to be better than what you're thinking now. So you turn back yeah. the page and you look and it is. And then you're like, oh, I'm supposed to be working on this. And then all of a sudden the brain is not focused on the I don't want to. It's focused on the work that you told yourself last session that you need to do now. Yeah. But you yeah. have to leave these tidbits for yourself, people. Don't leave it up to whatever in the universe. You have to leave a breadcrumb trail. Well, yeah. that's a that's a great personal success habit that you just dropped there. That's a huge nugget for our listeners to recognize that, you know, Mike Tyson says it this way. Everybody's got a plan till he gets punched in the face. Yeah. And that's really true is that when things are not going well, you have to have a plan. The whole idea of developing first principles. We talk about that a lot in our, in our podcast about developing life first principles for health and fitness predominantly, but it overflows into all the other areas of your life. The whole idea behind that is to have a plan when things are going great, when things are going not so good and when things are really going terrible. And so having a plan, having it like I came into the gym last night, all my ladies canceled out last night for different reasons. So Michelle and I were in the gym and and I had left my clothes at home and I had a long day in clinic and I was like, ah, I don't want to go home and get my clothes. And I realized I had a pair of warm ups, dirty warm ups in the back of my truck. And I was wearing an undershirt <laughs> under my, my dress shirt. So I said, I can train. She said, is that a wife beater shirt? And I said, no, no, it's a V-neck tee. And so I wore my V-neck tee. I had some tennis shoes in the back of my truck, my dirty warm ups, and I trained. But I was crazy sore because I did stupid interval training on Sunday and I ran my calves my hips crazy sore i but saw I got in the that gym. three miles people it was not a small run it was three miles I, yeah. I know i know and i got i got in the gym last night and i got leg press done i got some presses done with a heavy double at, on the top set and then i got um, chins done weighted chins and so i got something done you know so those are the I, and i'm not saying i'm successful but those are the habits those are the type of habits and life skills and skill set that you have to develop whether you want to do it or not. Everyone's human. A lot of us don't want to do things. Right. Yeah, and so let's but, talk about that. Darren went in and did his thing. But people listening to this, it doesn't mean you have to get it. If you don't feel like it and you get in there and all you do is one set of chins and yep. one set of five on whatever, that's your done for the day. And that's yeah, fine. Absolutely. That's fine. You've checked the box. Move on. Because you know what? The next time you go into the gym, it's a new day. It's, yeah, it's right. brand yeah, new. Yeah, we yeah. get to start over. Don't ever yeah. look at somebody else's norm or what they do as what you right. should do. The only rule is you can't do nothing. You cannot that's be right. sedentary. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because it's that's not right. yeah. only with the body. You're also letting the mind be 
numb. Yep. And we don't yeah. want that. Famous bodybuilder that I really like, Frank Zane, once said, if you walk into the gym and you get ready to do your first lift on your equipment or in your barbell or whatever you're doing, Frank Zane's amazing bodybuilder, body like a Greek god. He said, if you walk into the gym and you have one negative thought about that first lift, you being able to do it, he said, take your stuff, take your lifting shoes off, put them in the bag, put your stuff up and go home and come back with a better attitude. Now, I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. What he was basically saying is have your mind ready to train just like you are your body. I also agree with the fact, though, that sometimes your mind is way out in left field and you just train. And by the end of the training session, you're you're on top of things. Yeah, yeah. you're 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 crazy yeah. on top of things. I yeah. want to talk about something really, really quick. And I see this pervasive lifestyle mantra being touted right now in popular culture. And that is this concept of safetyism. We've talked about it on our mm. podcast. We had a whole podcast on safetyism yeah. and the American culture. And I'm going to tell you guys something, and I'm going to say this with, with a certain amount of wisdom and knowledge. There is nothing valuable with being safe. And I mean it from the sense of don't be reckless and stupid. You don't jump out of an aircraft without a parachute. Right. But if you have trained and you've learned how to jump, I've done an accelerated free fall, you know, skydiving, not tandem, accelerated free fall. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but if you've trained and you've done thousands of repetitions to learn what to do when you jump out of the aircraft and you have a parachute on, that's a risky thing to do, but it's not unsafe. Right. It's, it, there's a difference between calculated risk and just being plain and simple, stupid, right? you know? And so, but I see this culture right now that we have that, you know, look at it in these uncertain times, in times like these, yeah. we have all this stuff going on where everybody wants to make you fearful because they're selling you something, yeah, a product right. or service or, or a lifestyle or a sense of obedience to the norm, whatever that is, to the dogma of the day. But what I'm really saying is this, is that Barbell training is crazy safe, but again, all the good stuff in life is not always safe. Yeah, the I said this in the safetyism episode, and this is something that I, a lot of people don't understand, like the concept of risk. And when we apply it to everyday life, you know, you there's risk is inherent to our world and our existence. It is inherent in nature, and it's the we have created a a civilization where. We have been able to mitigate certain risks of, of the natural world. Like we've been able to mitigate a lot of diseases. We don't have problems here in the United States with, with, with water usually. We get clean drinking water and all these kind of basic, like fundamental aspects of survival that animals and, and, and living creatures have to deal with. We've mitigated them through our civilization, but it doesn't take the risk away. Right. Just living in the world is a risky thing because you can lose your life. Like there's always something at stake in everything you do. So I drive down the highway every day to come to this gym I, and twice a day on two days. So that's eight times a week. And um, that's a risky endeavor because I don't have control over the other people around me when I'm driving. Right. In the in the big grand scheme of things, training is a very controllable and and planned and logical event it's it's not very risky when you compare it to everything other, every other risk you're taking in your life. And the idea that you can eliminate risk in your life is is a falsehood. Um, it's not possible. Well, and it also drives our human actions and reactions on a fear model. Yeah. On a fear right. model versus 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 on a on a, a fight model. You know, it's a flight versus fight model. And I think that um I I, I told Michelle the other day, I told my wife the other day, I said I'm not a fear motivated person. It's not part of my personality. And that makes it hard for people to relate to me sometimes. It doesn't mean that I don't get scared of things. And it doesn't mean that I'm not fearful of certain things, but they're real things. Right. There's well, very few yeah. unreal fears that I have just because I'm so that way. It's just kind of the way I think. Yeah. But I have to recognize too that, that when I hear people say, well, you know what? In the future, I'm not real sure if that's, I'm not real sure if I'm going to be able to do that. I'm like, well, that's in the future. Right. I'm not sure either. Yeah. But I can't I can't analyze that. I can't control that. I can't I can't put my hands around what's in the future. I can only put my hands around what's here and now. Yeah. And analyze what I've done in the past and then shape my efforts today by my experiences and actions in the past too. And then make new 
directions the way I need to, to have better success in my life. And I think a lot of people, when it comes to this kind of training, they walk in the door. I mean, Charity, there's a lot of people that are listening to this podcast right now that this is so, you know, lifting with barbells and doing fitness in general is so far out of their, um, wor- their mindset of thinking that our job as coaches and my job, hopefully here on 40 Fit radio is to provide a, a, a knowledge source yeah. and an information channel to say, you can do this and this is for you. Yeah. You can do Absolutely. this and this is for you. And we're going to provide you the information that you need to ensure that what you're doing it has a good, effective return on investment. Right. And um, I, I think, okay, so Charity, I got a question for you. Yep. Or I'm just going to babble on. So we've got lots of ladies and men out there that, like I said, that this is this is really far from their their mindset. They're feel fearful of going into into a gym. They're um, they don't want to do the hard. Um, so you you and I know that you can't make someone do something, right? You can lead a horse right. to water, but you can't make them drink, kind of thing. You know how many times have we heard that in our life. What's your suggestion to those people out there who, a family member who's driving along, riding along in a car right now on a quick trip somewhere, their spouse lifts barbells and they've got us on their car right now listening to this podcast. What would you say to them about doing what we do uh, with our clients and as coaches? Well, that's easy one. The first thing I would tell them is that uh, no matter what you're thinking, the first thing you should be have uh, the thought in your head is taking action on something, whether that be, yeah, I want you in the gym with me uh, doing what I do it with a version of you. B- but if that's not, you need to take action with something that's going to lead to a better quality of life, because the overall thing that everyone wants is to stay independent. They want to be able to do what they want to do for as long as they can. So yeah. The note is, and I get this from Brett McKay, actually, is take action. Do something. Sure. Push the button. Yeah. And it doesn't mean just try it. Like you've always wanted to do hikes on Sunday. Find a trail. Get some hiking boots and do it. Right. Start there. And then you may find out, hey, for me to be able to do this hiking thing that I really love, I really need to get these legs stronger. Mm -hmm. And that will make you think about doing something else. So sometimes barbell isn't the first answer. It may be having to try that thing that you really want to do, but then you find out that you've got to do something else to be able to do that. So take action, get started. Yeah, good. That's a great point. Yeah. Simple, but grand advice. Very wise advice. Yeah. You're, you know, what's the key to insanity is doing the same thing and expecting different results. You know, right. you know, you, if, if you want different results in your life and your, in your health and fitness, if you want your cholesterol down, if you want your hypertension under control, if you want your metabolic syndrome or insulin level and diabetes under control, then there's, I mean, the doctors can keep giving you medicine. I mean, we got We live in a world of pharmacopoeia, but that's not the ultimate answer. The ultimate answer is in your control. Yeah. Yes. And, and you got to take action. Well, Harry, let's go off the topic here, but on that, everybody grow your own food. I think the food is killing us. So even if you live in town and you don't think you can, yes, you can get a whiskey barrel, put some plants in them. Yep. I promise you, I'm my goal. And this is scary for me. I am. I've watched my grand do it all my life, but I'm not a canner, but I'm going to be. And uh, I'm going to have that garden and I'm going to have the root cellar in the pantry. And uh, I'm it's just. I really have a strong feeling of that. Grow your own food. You don't need the supermarket, friends. And then after yeah. that, find somebody that does their own beef and does their own chickens. Yep. Right, right. I think it's yep. key because the pharmaceutical yeah. people are making lots of cash on who. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think, the- I. you know, we talked about, we need to do a podcast on on good, healthy sources for food. I know there's a lot of people that live in the city. I know there's a lot of people that don't live in an environment where they can grow a lot of their own food, a lot, but there's so many resources. Let's put it this way. Where there's a will, there's a way. There's so many resources where you can do a micro farm and you can do all these cool things. You know, we grow our own beef. Um, We're, when we move out to the ranch, we're going to start our own garden. Uh, We're not doing a garden right now because I live in my truck pretty much, right. but we're going to do our own garden. And I think that I do between the ranch and home and work. And, but I think that, uh, 
it's important to, again, health and fitness topics, trying to get good stuff in yeah. so that we can take advantage of all this hard work that we're doing. Yeah. And, and there's, there, there's, there's definitely like a mental component to that, like getting in touch with your primal existence. Like, again, like I, like I said, it's easy to like, we, we, we often convince ourselves as you know, that we are modern humans, like as if somehow we're different animals than we were a hundred thousand years ago. Cause from an evolutionary perspective, we're not right. We have developed civilization, but we haven't changed as creatures and the, the basic nature of the world hasn't changed either, right? We've just built a layer on top of it that has excused us from the need to grow our own food and hunt our own food. But the reality is still out there. Like every other creature in the animal kingdom is competing for that. And so doing it at some small level, I think it mentally, that puts you in the mindset of, of, you know, the way the world really works, which is, you know, hey, if this civilization fell apart or if, or if it was just stripped away, if you were born in a different time, this is what you would be doing to live. Well, and um, you need to be, this sounds crazy, but I really think that you should be intimate with what you eat. It is yeah. the reason we are overweight. People just consume, consume, consume with yeah. no thought to what actually went into getting whatever they're putting in their mouth. They have no idea. Yeah. People are far removed from their food source. Yeah. I mean, they're far removed. We talk about that in the agricultural, um, you know, in the, in the agricultural lifestyle and in the Western lifestyle where we have our ranch and cattle and everything. It's amazing how many kids don't know where beef, co- a hamburger from McDonald's comes from, uh, a hamburger from a store comes from, or, or you know, a restaurant. It's it just, they're so far removed from um, the food source. Right. And, um, and there's a big push right now also to have sustainable farming models, sustainable beef raising t- techniques, and to also, uh, have humane techniques to people. It's, it's really weird. We are seeing a, we are seeing a, a surge in consumers who want to connect with, um, their, their food and how it was raised and how it was treated, especially in the, me- you know, the yeah. mammal, Top, top foods, um, uh, chickens and cows and stuff like that. And so I could see us eventually with our cattle herd, I could see us going private label source where we actually sell our beef direct to um, uh, discerning consumers, mm-hmm. basically, where we don't take it to the sale. Um, we're, we're in an, a, a sale model right now through Integrity Beef, Noble, Founda- Noble Research Foundation out of Oklahoma. So we're in the Integrity Beef model, which is a wonderful, sustainable cattle ranching practice model. But but at the same time, the prices are so low that I could actually generate more income, which would help me grow more cattle, more calves for the slaughter market. And I could go direct to consumers, do a little website and offer people high quality beef with um, humane and sustainable practices. You should build yeah. your own so, uh, processing. You should do it all yourself. There. Yeah, we've talked all about doing All yourself. That. And then and, uh, cut the middleman out. You know how it's yep. done. Vertically you know integrate. how it's taken care of. Um, there, there is a market for that right now. And if you have the yeah, money to start sure. it and you're on the, you know, this side of it can do it quick. I think it's very profitable. And plus, it's all word of mouth. You've got a good product. Yeah. Your beef's good. They know you treat your animals yeah. well. It'll, it, it counts. Um, yeah. yeah. You know, this homestead we- thing is going to be hard. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I'm like, how am I going to train? And how am I going to can? And how am I going to... Well, uh, it comes a point where um, I've had a hard time melding those two things together, you know, but it has to be done because for me to be able to train the way I want to, my food quality has got to be better. And the only way to stay young is you've got to give yourself jobs. Retirement does not mean a chair and a remote. We're not made for that. I agree. We are not. My grandma's 87. And she told me, she said, these kids think they're helping by taking things away. I had a wash house. They bring my stuff inside. She was like, then I no longer have to walk as far. She was like, yep. I hate it. She was like, well, what am I going to do? Yep. She's like, I had a huge garden and you know, they just take the garden away. And finally I, I went crazy. I said, you guys got to put some raised beds, you know? And so they finally did because she has to have something to do. The woman doesn't stop. Sure. She cooks. Yeah. yeah. She, she picks her fruit. She does whatever. And she says, that's why I'm 87 and I get around better than most of my kids. It's true. Yeah. You know, we could, we could have a whole episode. Charity, we need to do this. You have you yeah. and Scott on and have a whole, a whole episode on the sedentary 
uh, retirement pleasure lifestyle. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with pleasure in life. There's nothing wrong with enjoying the fruits of your labor. But um, I'm a firm believer. My father-in-law's in in his eighth decade of life. And he is so and, handsome. Uh, you all would never, uh, listeners uh, out there, you would <laughs> never know the age of yeah. this man. Good job. Right. And he still does his job day in, day out. And he w- he is so much healthier than his cohorts because he's not bought into the idea of the American dream is to just sit back and collect shells and watch TV and read right. a book. All those things have are, are great, but that's not. Humans are like any other mammal. We need to maximize our genetic potential through using our bodies till we die. If we don't, if we don't use it, we're going to lose it. That's right. And so um, That's right. I, I've never bought into the American dream of just retiring and sitting on my place. When I retire from practicing physical therapy, I'm going to have a full-time job running my ranch. Yeah. I mean, I have a full-time job right now. So, right. right. But, um, but it's just a difference. It's a different lifestyle. Yeah. And we can still enjoy vacations and doing wonderful things and all those things, but but humans are healthier when we when we work. Yeah. And so I, I think that's listening to you all talk. I think that's uh, the key insight here when it comes to training is um, this is part of a healthy lifestyle. And let's start changing your thinking about what it is that you do as a core part of your life. What are the core elements of your life? If you're a parent, taking care of your kids, managing the schedule, that's a core element of your life. Well, training is too, and it can be. Right. And let's make it fit into your life um, sure. because it is it is a an elemental part of existence. Well, guys, thanks for joining us today. Charity, thanks for joining us on the podcast. We plan to have you on more. Well, I would love that. And it's yeah. good to see you guys. I miss y'all. We, we might make you like a regular female component to the that podcast. That would be very fun. I would right? enjoy that. Because you're be actually 40 fit and you fit the mantra. I do. And you know, I'm in my you know, 40s. You know, yeah. And so... Thanks for joining 40 Fit Radio and thanks for joining the 40 Fit Nation today. If you'd like to get a hold of Charity Hambrick, how would they do that, Charity? You can find me on Instagram at Charity Silver Strength, or you can email me if you have questions and I'll answer at charity at silver hyphen strength dot com. Are you taking new clients? Always. Okay. Right. Are you taking like remote clients too? Are you doing remote clients and in-person clients? Well, in-person is and- tricky right now because you know I'm living in a... Yeah, <laughs> living in a small temporary place. housing, right? Yeah, yeah I got but, you. But uh, and this COVID junk, but I'm not. Uh, yeah. I'm not saying no to that. You know, I might open my wings and let somebody come in my little, little tiny one car garage. Sure. You know, but I'm all about advice and helping them get started. So. Cool. We'll do what we can. Cool. Well, she's a great strength coach, great person, whether you're male or female, any age. Uh, she would, you would be, you would be very, very lucky to hire her as a coach. Yeah, so, absolutely. Excellent barbell coach, great skill set, um, very technically minded. So, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for being on this podcast. And I really don't have anything else to say. I won't give our normal. You can find us here. People know where to find us. You know where to find us. Info at forty fit dot com for email. Yeah, that's so, right. So guys, go and train and, you know, share this episode with somebody that you know that does not train right now, but they're trying to make a change. They just don't know how. They don't know where the first step is. And uh, maybe we can do our little part to change their mindset and get them thinking like someone of the 40 Fit Nation. Yep. And in the words of Coach Charity, take action.